Do you have a prediction on who's going to win this year's election? First of all, I'll be pleasantly surprised if there is an election. If there's a genuine fear that, that Trump could win, the election could just be canceled. The 2024 election cycle is underway, and our guest today poses the question, will there even be an election in November? Jeffrey Tucker is founder and president at Brownstone Institute. He's also the author of 10 books, including Life After Lockdown, and many thousands of articles online. Today, we talk extensively about the recent Supreme Court case and its potential impact on the 2024 election. And he contrasts a Biden or Trump victory and what the economy may look like as a result in 2025 and beyond. He wastes no time getting into it. So please enjoy the discussion. All right. Hello, Jeffrey. It's very, it's really good to see you again. How are you, sir? Well, as well as I can be, given the state of the world. <laughs> <laughs> what an answer. Right? Yeah. Well, I think that's a common refrain these days, regardless of who you're talking to. I, <sighs> I, I'm really glad to have you on here today because, you know, we've got the 2024 election, it's bearing down upon us, and it's setting up to be probably the most contentious election in recent memory. I'd like to frame this election around this idea of, of this case that's in the Supreme Court right now. It's Murthy uh, v. Missouri, and how it might pertain and how it might impact this year's presidential landscape, as well as presidential elections going forward. So I don't think that people know much about Murthy versus Missouri. So if you could kind of tell us what that case is all about and uh, kind of explain the wide reaching implications for, for the outcome. The case came about because a lot of people were, uh, were silenced during 2020 and 2021. A lot of my friends uh, were taken down from social media, their posts throttled, their accounts deleted, and that sort of thing. And these were top scientists that were saying scientific things, true things, true things. And they were consistently blocked while uh, fake science was 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 pushed in exchange. I mean, it, it became strange because uh, the scientists were just saying normal things like natural immunity works, uh, masks don't stop respiratory uh, viruses, uh, with uh, and, you know, lockdowns are not going to uh, somehow extinguish a, a virus with a zoonotic reservoir. Normal things like that that everybody accepted and believed in 2019 suddenly became you know untrue and all my friends were getting notifications that well this is a violation of community standards so it all began with FOIA requests and what we found out was that the head of the national institutes for health uh, francis collins had written to anthony fauci saying uh, we need to t take down these these crazy fringe epidemiologists and make make sure that they experience you know devastation and um, and refutation, and it became a little strange. So so that sort of provoked some deeper looks, and then eventually a, a, a lawsuit. And more for your requests, and then discovery from the lawsuit, and at the end of which we ended up with twenty thousand pages uh, discovering a vast machinery of of censorship and control, where there's this kind of unified relationship. I mean, contentious, but unified uh, between agencies, federal government agencies. And social media companies, so they were working very closely together, and they they, they weren't really denying it, but but of course, you know, for these kind of lawsuits, you have to have the evidence. So the evidence was was all there, um, and and all these researchers, and again, many of them associated with the Brownstone Institute, uh, discovered that that because because the federal government knows that it can't just directly censor, it can't you know just order Google to to do things. It came up with a scheme whereby it paid university-based centers and various nonprofit organizations, some not entirely located in the U.S., and really developed a network of hundreds of institutions that they could use to, uh, you know, develop credibility and and forge relationships with social media companies, and then federal agencies would would engage in a process they called switchboarding. So, uh, let's say they decide that Doug Hill is a bad guy. 
then they would, they would then the next step would be to try to figure out well what's the best way to get at him and oh let's use the election integrity partnership or let's use the center for for putting down uh, hateful people on the internet or whatever and they would contact them and drop your name and or the subject you're talking about and then push these social media companies to engage in this and then even even agitate for the social media companies to rewrite their terms of use so that it would exclude uh, what it is you're talking about. And this, this got worse from 2020 to 2021 um, to the point that if you said, look, I have a vaccine injury, you know, Facebook would not p push that out, even if it was mm -hmm. entirely true. So, so with these just these little kind of threads, we discovered, uh, you know, a giant... Uh, to continue the metaphor, you know, blanket or <laughs> something. I don't know how you would describe it, but it's a huge apparatus whereby the administrative state is specifically curating and controlling the public mind, sometimes in cooperation with their embedded employees at places like Microsoft, Google, and Twitter 1.0, and sometimes through third parties through the switchboarding uh, operations. But it was, you know, highly effective and definitely run from the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency of the Department of Homeland Security, which is the same, it's called CISA, founded in 2018, the same uh, agency that broke the workforce into essential and unessential um, four years ago on March 19th, uh, 2020, and then also verified the um, safety and integrity of mail-in ballots. So it was, you know, this stuff gets crazy once you start looking at it, and it, that, let's just say it's, it's obviously unconstitutional. So this case went to the Fifth Circuit, and the judge was alarmed. He said, this is the worst violations of free speech in American history. And so he issued an injunction, which went through the usual rounds and landed at the Supreme Court. And uh, the Supreme Court heard the case, and, and, and the justices were, I would say, mostly very confused about what they were hearing uh, because they're just encountering this trillion dollar enterprise for the first time. And they said, well, what does this injunction mean? Does that mean that you know, like government agencies can't be in communication with Facebook? What's, what's wrong with that? You know, that doesn't violate any free speech. And so the plaintiff's attorney was, was uh, you know, up to him to try to explain that's really not what we're talking about. We're not just right. talking about communication. We're talking about um, building a, a, a massive machinery of compulsion and coercion to uh, to basically end freedom on the internet. I mean, that's that's really what's at issue. But the I would say the things did not go well with the court, and very likely the injunction will not be approved, and and agencies will suddenly be celebrating, and there'll be cheers all around, and hundreds of government agencies are going to get involved in uh, crushing um, alternative uh, points of view on the internet, and this is this is going to this is going to all unfold because this judgment will come down in June. This is my prediction that the injunction won't be upheld or will be upheld so narrowly as to be irrelevant, and then they'll have between July and November to completely control and manage all media mm -hmm. uh, in the country, from C CNN to Google to uh, you know every app on your phone, phone and they're going to start taking down websites and taking down alternative uh, sources of news. So it's, I'm sorry to report this, but it, it looks you know, tremendously grim. There's a reason why hardly anybody has read about this. It's because most media and mainstream social media is is completely captured. Yeah. It's interesting that you mentioned the terms of service as being the tool that they pressured uh, social media sites on, and if I'm understanding you correctly, because that makes complete sense, right? It, it, it And for lack of a better word, it codifies, it puts the company in a position of saying, no, this type of speech does not fit our new terms of service, which you're saying has been forced upon them in some way or another by uh, an administration or uh, a three-lettered agency or whatever. Do I have that characterization right? Yeah, and uh, keep in mind, we have 20,000 pages of documentation on this, and it probably could be expanded to a quarter million, and it probably will be by the time the, trace, the case has gone to trial, which it hasn't yet. 
And just in case any of our listeners think that, oh, well, this is all going to work out in the end because the American court system is fair, um, I don't believe that. I, I think I think it's going to be five or six years in litigation, and then at the end, a, a appeals court will um, reject the entire thing on grounds that the plaintiffs don't have standing or something absurd like uh, absurd like that. But let me give an example of these terms of use. I think it was in 2021. I don't know the precise month, but YouTube suddenly announced that anything that contradicts the public health advice of the World Health Organization or the CDC will now not be allowed on YouTube, which is pretty much anything. I mean, like if I said, yeah, I have my doubts uh, that masks are going to end this pandemic, you know, they could just delete the video. But, you know, if you can't contradict the World Health Organization, I mean, that's, that's basically everything related to health and medicine. Uh, on YouTube uh, has to get through this filter. And they took down millions of videos. I mean, uh, we got millions of videos a day. I mean, it was just unbelievable. But they changed their their their, their terms of use. So the, and, and YouTube is owned by Google. Mm. So that means that Google, which is used for 96% of people's internet searches, uh, is entirely censored according to the demands of the World Health Organization. I mean, and it's not just that. It's on on everything related to politics, election fraud. I mean, you know, the you know, if you dare to claim the election was stolen from Trump, you know, you're de- you're going to be silenced, you know, really quickly. You're going to be you're going to be you know, canceled and deleted. Yeah. Uh, you will be, you know, offed in any kind of electronic sense, you know, instantly. Uh, so this is what we're coming down to and this is what the court was trying to consider but there wasn't I wouldn't say there was a single justice there who understood the scale and implications of what we're talking about here they they even the justices themselves it's the strangest thing because I was observing this Shashay, are themselves victims of this censorship industrial complex so that you cannot know what you do not know and they they continue to believe that this is a normal country with normal inflammation flows and if this were true, they would surely know it. Well, the opposite is the case. I mean, w- when you're in a situation where the Supreme Court justices themselves could be plaintiffs in the cases they're adjudicating, but don't know it, we're in a weird, we're in a weird world. You know, I, I find that whole trust the science idea, and I know you've written a book about it. Life After Lockdowns, and we'll talk about that book uh, here, Jeffrey, uh, on this call today. But the whole idea of trust the science, the scientific method is based on the idea of having a thesis and then trying to prove it wrong, publishing that thesis and having other people point out all the problems with it or all the particular exceptions. But in this environment, that process, you know, during the COVID process, it, it completely went away. It was, this is the truth, <laughs> right or wrong. And it turns out we're learning over the last four years, a lot of what they were saying was absolutely wrong, but that you weren't allowed to say it. And so I wonder where that leads us if this thing does actually pass. You know, and, and the, the truth of the matter is actually much worse than than you can even imagine because... Um, you know, the, the sort of the gold standard of public health research that would examine, uh, do meta st- media, meta-analysis, which is like looking at all the existing studies and aggregating them and coming to a generalized conclusion uh, concerning random controlled trials, which is sort of the gold standard of, of, of um, science, I think probably wrongly, but that's what is widely considered. So back in 2005, uh, it's, it's a, a publication called the Cochrane Review, which was set up specifically to get rid of all the junk science. It was put, put together by a, a gang of people at Oxford University and elsewhere who believed they were evidence-based. It was called Evidence-Based Science Journal, and everybody in the world accepted the Cochrane Review as being the standard. I mean, if it wasn't the standard, nobody knew what what is okay so mm-hmm. like that's it well some from 2005 to five onwards they had done uh, a meta-analysis of physical interventions to interrupt the spread of viral pandemics or viral spread of disease flus or whatever 
uh, any respiratory infections. And they, their, their analysis from 2005 all the way up to the minute of lockdowns in 2020 had, and, and they had done, I'm going to say, eight iterations of the same study, had consistently said that none of these things work. Masking, distancing, you know, infinite hand washing and leaping around, <laughs> one-way grocery aisles, whatever the hell it is. Uh, did absolutely nothing. And so this was the scientific consensus, acknowledged, admitted, linkable, public, universally accepted, so on, so on. Over, over 15 years of meta-analyses, of random controlled trials, this is what they concluded, that none of these things work. And yet we did it anyway. Right. Uh, so it, it's you know the once you look at it, it's it's astounding. So by force, by administrative decree, not just in the U.S. but in many other places in the world, there was a forced replacement of existing scientific orthodoxy with a phony baloney experiment and gibberish, and it was the gibberish that got amplified all through the media over the last forty years. And the science that was specifically blocked, suppressed, censored, and so on. So we know this now. I mean, I'm, I'm almost astonished to hear myself even explain to you what happened because it sounds so crazy. But it is, it is that crazy. Well, I, I want to read something because I was looking up. Uh, I was on Politico this morning and I saw this headline. And I wanted to read it. and We'll put it up on the screen here. Uh, the headline is "Challenge to Biden Hectoring of Social Media Firms Appears Doomed at the Supreme Court." And the first, the first paragraph of this says, "A lawsuit aimed at stopping the Biden administration from urging social media companies to take down purported disinformation about COVID vaccines and election fraud got a decidedly chilly reception at the Supreme Court Monday." Mm. Now, I want to move this into. Uh, to the election and, and the impact of uh, it could have on this year's election. But the framing of this just in, in Politico, I don't know how reputable Politico is. I, you know, it's a name certainly as popular, uh, but framing it as a Biden administration, um, you know, stopping this one administration seems to fall short. It doesn't pass the sniff test for me because if they strike this down and they allow government to go ahead and, do whatever they want in terms of making sure that news or posts are sanitized for our own protection. If they do that, it would it would certainly allow you know the Biden administration to continue to do it, but also future administrations to do it. So, what is the moral hazard here that that we're we're throwing ourselves into to to try, try and protect ourselves? The critical way to understand all American politics is that it's not really, in the end, except at the most superficial uh, uh, level, a battle between Republicans and Democrats, liberals and conservatives, and all these other ideological things, uh, or party politics. This is the, the key desiderata to understand our times, is that we're facing an epic, titanic struggle between the administrative state, which is the permanent bureaucracy, of the federal government and all their outposts in states and localities versus the people and their aspiration to have some control over the regime under which they live. If you understand that, then you pretty much understand absolutely everything. The administrative state is a couple million, three million people. Um, administrative state includes a sector called the deep state, which includes most intelligence agencies. They've been seriously empowered over the last four years. Those, and they are, have every intention of retaining this power, uh, whomever is elected, whether it's the Democrats or the Republicans. And if Trump wins, there's going to be a full court press to make sure that administrative apparatus maintains hegemony over Washington, just like they did in the first Trump administration. And if Biden uh, wins, then it's going to be a green light. You know, I mean, the Biden administration is nothing but, you know, a, a, a marionettes who just dance for the public and let the administrators run everything. So uh, a Trump administration will try to contain the administrators, but, you know, and they have every intention of doing it. But I tell you. The administrative state has all the institutional knowledge. They know all the tricks of the trade. They know what's what. Um, 
they they know how Washington runs, and no amount of elected interlopers is going to uh, be able to interrupt that. So that's that's the struggle we face today. That's the essence of it. And the administrators are very panicked right now that that uh, the people are are catching on. They don't like it. And by the people are catching on, I mean maybe ten or fifteen percent. All right, but that's way more than was true uh, five years ago. I think it's pretty clear. Free speech is the most critical. It's the reason why it's it, it's the first thing listed in the in the Constitution. So, what are the implications for this year's election if this thing does not go the way we want it to? All right. Well, so if the defense, which is to say the Biden administration, uh, gets a real victory here, which I'm fully expecting they will, uh, then all media consumed between uh, June and November will be vote for Biden propaganda. Right, that'll that'll be it. And Completely whitewashed in your view. Yeah. Completely. Yeah. yeah, you won't be able to to know anything else. And then and then starting after the election, if Biden really does win again, there's going to be concerted efforts on the part of the agencies and everybody else associated with legacy government power uh, to take down independent sources of news, either capture them or take them down, whether it's Substack or Elon Musk's X or your various channels or anybody else's independent websites. Like You either have to go along or risk uh, what's called lawfare uh, to des- to destroy your existence. And that's that's the goal. It's, it's complete control of the internet in the United States and Europe, similarly, in the same way they have it already in China. That that's the ambition, and and at a court judgment and against the injunction in favor of the defense to throw it back to the district court to actually hear the case, uh, which will unfold over the next three, four, five, six years. That's what that's going to amount to. At the end of which, uh, there, there will be no more um, information freedom, and the the First Amendment will become a dead letter. That's terrifying. Yeah, and I'm my sadness about this situation. You're right; it's existential, right? I mean, this is this is the core of the Constitution. It really is just like you might as well break into the National Archives and smash that glass, pick up that piece of parchment, and rip it into shreds. At that point, there won't be anything. Le- there won't be anything left of it. At that point, if if we lose if we lose the First Amendment, we'll we'll lose every other bit of it, and we've already lost a lot of it. But we have believed that we have. Uh, freedom of speech, but but it turns out, looking back, that they've made so many encroachments on this, and they've done it mostly in secret. And now that it's coming to the fore, and the Supreme Court heard the case, yet yeah, more people know about it than ever. But um, but if the court doesn't go the right direction, then the censorship um, hegemon will just make gigantic advances, and as I say, people won't know what they don't know, and they won't know they're being censored. And uh, the dissidents will be treated as uh, thought criminals, and um, yeah, we'll we'll be in in the in t- t- territory of totalitarianism. Yeah. Uh, at that point, that that's 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 genuinely how serious this is, and I wish I could, you know, present to you a, a alternative scenario. In which you know the people rise up and take back their government, but I'm, I'm not so sure that that's yeah. um, in the cards. You know, I I just wonder how uh, people perceive uh, a message like this, or or because I think that it seems so preposterous that we're at this decision and this this discussion that's being had uh, at the Supreme Court. Is that dire if it goes one way versus the other? I think it just doesn't it, it doesn't land with people. I don't know that anyone sitting at home right now is like, yeah, okay, Jeffrey, you're you know, your head's in the clouds, you're you know, whatever, right? But the I I agree with you. I think that this is a um, a monumental case, and if it doesn't move the right way, we're all we're all going to see things that we thought we never would see before, yeah. much like you know, pre COVID. Uh, prior to COVID, if you said that the government was going to lock down the economy, um, right. you would have been called a lunatic. You're like, what are you talking about? They have no interest in doing that. But uh, yet it happened. And they're setting the table for if it does happen again, which is likely, maybe not be a pandemic, but 
maybe it's something else, a financial crisis or whatever, those critical voices are going to be silenced. And that, that should fear everybody uh, watching this call. Well, sure. what, I'd, what I'd like to do, Jeffrey, is, is, is move on to the, <clears throat> to, to the light. First off, do you have a prediction on who's going to win this year's election? And does what happened in June play a role in your mind as to who may win? Well, um, first of all, I'll be pleasantly surprised if there is an election. Okay, you're going to have to explain that. It's one thing that NATO countries are doing now is just canceling elections. So that could happen. If there's, if there's a genuine fear that, that Trump could win, the election could just be canceled, you know, under any pretense. That could happen. I mean, I, I, I think that's very possible. They'll just say, look, there's too much disinformation. Uh, we've gotten reports that, that Russia is taking over our, uh, our channels of communication. It's too dangerous. We cannot have a fair election under these, con- uh, under these con- conditions. You know, whatever. This is an emergency. We're going to put this off. We're going to put this off till January till we can, you know, see what's going on. So, you know, that's, that's a possibility, especially if, if Trump continues to making these advances. And if you look at the betting odds, which I, I don't think the betting odds tell you what's true, but they may be closer to what's true than the uh, polls. Mm-hmm. And the betting odds are right now dramatically favor Trump by 15, 16, 17 points. Wow. So if that continues to be true, um, you could just see the cancellation of elections. So here's the thing. On grounds that Trump is such a dangerous figure uh, that he's called for a bloodbath if he wins, that um, he's, he's, you know, so on. You know, all the lies you hear. Yeah. Um, they could just say, look, in order to protect, uh, preserve, protect and preserve democracy as we know it, uh, this guy just simply cannot, uh, cannot be allowed to win. And uh, this is existential for the United States. We're a democracy. This guy is not, not believing the system. He's already shown us, you know, from January the 6th when he tried to engage in insurrection. So um, in the name of preserving our freedoms and rights and democracy, we, we have to get rid of this election. I mean, I'd like to talk a little bit about that because it, that seems even more preposterous than a, than a COVID shutdown prior yeah. to COVID. So is there any precedent for anything like that in... No. No precedent. No, so this, there was no precedent for lockdowns either, as you say. There's no precedent for stay-at-home orders uh, in peacetime. I mean, there was no precedent for this kind of censorship. There's no precedent for canceling uh, two two successive seasons of religious holidays. I mean, there's there's no precedent for any of this stuff. So you know, uh, it was it was all based on shock and awe. It should get us used to extreme situations. So that yeah, uh, canceling the election. Sounds like extreme, but it's it's something I wouldn't rule out. I wouldn't say it's the most likely, but it um, but it it could happen. So I think the most likely thing is that Biden will win because um, they've already figured out the the balloting situation. That's the reason for the waves of immigration. Um, that's not just a long term strategy to game the census to make sure that red states don't lose representation. They'll gain it. Uh, most of the m- migrant populations are being sent to purple states um, to flip them uh, to blue. Um, so uh, they don't want the red states to gain. So um, <clears throat> so th- that's that's the goal there. But beyond that, uh, with mail-in voting, there's there's no way that you can um, verify citizenship. You know, you it's, it's just a box you check it. And uh, right. and, and 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 by the way, I'm not even I'm not even saying. That these these migrant populations are are, are definitely going to vote for Joe Biden I'd, or fill out mail-in ballots. They're not going to. The point is to rig rig the system so that your ballot numbers are not inconsistent with your population numbers, so you can have a plausible outcome. So I, th- I think this is the way they're going to pull it off uh, next time. Uh, the idea that Trump wins a fair and square uh, election, I don't. I think that's a really small chance of that actually happening. The wild card here is is Kennedy, and uh, normally I would fully rule out the possibility that a third party in the United States uh, could ever really win an election. I mean, or even make any get it any more than like what did Ross Perot get? I guess he got like thirteen percent or something like yeah. that. I mean, which is extremely high. You wouldn't expect that, and and the reason it has to do with what's called. Duviger's law, and the idea is that in a in an election, a winner take all election of any sort, um, three choices will always default 
to two because people engage in strategic voting. They fear one candidate more than the other, so they vote for somebody they don't particularly like in order to prevent the victory of somebody they really despise. Yeah. So, so that could mean that mm. that Kennedy could be polling higher than Trump or Biden, but still lose dramatically because the people who are voting fear either Biden or fear Trump more. And so they don't want to so-called waste their vote on a third party. So I would think normally Duverger's law would, would, would take Kennedy off the table. Um, but, you know, even that, that's an empirical law. It's not a law like gravity, right? Right. So, so I, think, I think there's a, a chance that, that, that I, don't know, I don't know exactly know what, what the scenario is. I mean, some people talk about neither Biden nor Trump getting enough electoral votes to win the presidency, and then that would cause the election to go to the House of Representatives where then the compromise candidate would be Kennedy. That seems like a lot of things that have to happen yeah. before that result happens. But I, I know that the Kennedy people are talking like that. I mean, the other option is that he manages somehow to get on, on the ballot in every state. Yep. He's and, gotten on a, lot, a fair number of ballots the last I've heard. Is that is that right? Uh, I think he's at four states now. Um, oh, four. But, okay, I thought. Yeah, it was, I thought it's, it was. You know, so, so you know, he's talking about joining with the libertarians, which you know usually that's a mistake. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So you know, uh, we'll see how that goes. But you know, you have to kind of consider for him to actually win something like that. You would have to um, have people willing to put up with either a Trump or a Biden victory. They're like indifferent to that mm -hmm. on the far flung hope that that Kennedy could actually win. And I just I don't really see that happening. But you know, I guess these days in the United States anything is actually possible. All right. It's, so it's worth me, considering. Let me throw out a, an alternative. Jim Rickards, who is on this channel very regularly, uh, he is suggesting that there's a real possibility that uh, Biden doesn't run. And once mm -hmm. all the delegates have been cast for Biden to to be the nominee, uh, that a, a third person comes in, you know, whether that be Gavin Newsom or some other uh, other individual to to run in, in Biden's stead. What probability do you put on that? Is it is that far flung or do you think that that's potentially likely given the poor polling numbers that he's seen thus far? Well, there's no question that that is plan B. I mean, that that is there is a scenario in which that really happens. And a lot of it entirely depends on on how well they calibrate um, Biden's uh, drug doses. And <laughs> they can keep him functioning and make him a plausible uh, function, functioning human being. Yeah. So if, if that's no longer possible, then then plan B will definitely happen. All right. So let's talk a little bit. You know, you cover a lot of topics at Brownstone and we'll talk about the Brownstone Institute here in a moment. But you talk a lot about uh, the economy as well. And so I wanted to get your take on material things that may change under a Biden versus a Trump presidency. So if if let's say for a moment that the that Biden wins or the Biden replacement, the plan B wins, what changes do you see, economically speaking, over the following four years uh, do you see taking place? Mm. Well, I think a new Biden regime would be more of the same. Uh, they are not backing off of their their Green New Deal EV stuff. I mean, it's actually extremely weird. They're they're coming up with ever more intense mandates to uh, to force car manufacturers to make cars that nobody wants to buy. I mean, it's just simply simply unbelievable. Now, you know, if you go back to twenty twenty. Uh, I mean, the whole EV craze was entirely artificial. You know, what, what happened was uh, the lockdowns happened. Um, car manufacturers canceled orders for chips. And, um, and, and then once they, uh, the demand for these cars picked back up again, um, let's say a year later, they tried to, or six, six, eight months later, tried to reorder the chips. Well, the chip manufacturers had moved on to making gaming units and, you know, laptops and that sort of thing. They couldn't get the chips. I mean, it was a weird period because some cars were, were completed and, and shipped w without automatic steering, for example. It's just unbelievable that it's actually happened. Yeah. But there was a gigantic shortage of cars in um, the fall of 2021. And so 
by the time the cars uh, came onto lots, um, a, a lot of car manufacturers have been propagandized that, oh, everybody just wants an EV now. This is the way of the future. You're going to be better make EVs or you suck, you know. So they sold a ton of EVs. Well, it turns out nobody likes them. They, they break. They're, they're, they're uh, very, go, very high insurance costs, 25, 30, 40 percent higher than, than internal combustion cars. And uh, the resale value is very low. So people just turned against them. And so car manufacturers have stopped making them and they're trying to comply with Biden administration mandates by making more uh, hybrid cars which people are are buying but but even that's going to go away and and people want gas cars i mean mm -hmm. and, unless you're looking for a speedy zippy fancy golf cart to drive around as an urban driver in nice weather um you know these EVs are just not going to take over the market but you got a Biden administration mandating them anyway which i don't know yeah. it sounds like Wild. I mean, so you make the car and what, throw it into the river? I mean, it doesn't make any sense. But that kind of thing is going to happen. Your gas stoves are going to be uh, taken from you for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, water restrictions. And then the blackouts come because the the grid cannot handle even the current usage, to say nothing of forecasted increases in usage over the next uh, three, four, or five years. So uh, there'll be rationing of electricity. It's, it's only going to get worse. And not to mention wage and price controls. Uh, we'll start to see uh, Biden's attack on shrinkflation, which represents you know a fundamental misunderstanding of the dynamics of inflation. They're going to continue to target corporate America. Uh, I think wage and price controls will just be the beginning. They're going to have regulations on packaging size and all sorts of things. You know, um, <laughs> it's going to be a level of, of, of despotism we never have, have seen before, just over the particulars of economics. Yeah, it's uh, interesting that just the ignorance or uh, I don't want to put blame, but or ignoring all the, you know, research and all the real world experience that we have on things that don't work. We're piling them all into as, you know, or as many of them as we can into one administration. I mean, yeah. there are discussions of minimum, you know, minimum income uh, out in California. I know they're doing some pilot projects out there. Yeah, um, yeah, but I mean, here's the thing, Doug. I mean, like we 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 need to get rid of this idea that we used to have in our heads that there's some mechanism in the social order that is self-correcting. <laughs> no I mean, it's just funny to hear you take it as like a normal human being. Well, if that doesn't work, why would they continue to do it? Yeah. But that's just the point. <laughs> I'm sorry to say it. I, no, I'm not. If I get it, I just, I mean, just you know, we used to work together at Lazy Fair Books, and we used to like yeah, talk yeah. about these ideas and yeah, the good old days, the good old yeah. days, and it's yeah. just, it's just like it's hard. It's a hard adjustment, but you know, when you see when you see government agencies blocking science and 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 putting forward crazed mythologies, you know, to reward industrial partners and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, anything becomes possible. So I don't I don't think these sort of self corrective mechanisms are in place anymore. Things don't work. They're gonna do them anyway and do them and do them harder. I mean you've got a gang of bureaucrats in charge of the world who believe first and foremost in their ideology. And they're angry at you know the rest of the world for not complying with their ideology. Right. And that just makes them lash out like the Joker. I mean that's I'm sorry to say, but that that is genuinely what's what's happening here. Um, and and by the way, I'm not entirely sure a, a, a Trump administration is the answer. I think it, I'm just saying that I think maybe it'd be better. I think there's m more normal people there. But you know, when you see him threatening Mexico with 100 percent tariffs, tariffs. On, I mean, on on car imports, you, you realize something that's extremely strange about Trump that um, people think they understand Trump, but I don't think they do. Yeah. My read on him, and it's been true for now going on 10 years, is that 90% of his brain is occupied by one subject only, and that's tariffs. That's what he thinks about all the time. That's what he loves. Mm -hmm. He loves tariffs, and he thinks tariffs solve everything. We've got to have tariffs as high as possible with as many countries as possible, and then American prosperity will come back. He believes this. Nobody can convince him otherwise. He's always believed this, and that's what he's going to use all of his power as the president to impose. And he has that power, right? That's what, one. Can you give me an example of when tariffs worked for the country that's imposing them? Well, some pe some people claim they worked in the in the eighteen uh, eighties to give steel the steel industry in the, in the United States advantages over uh, the Germany, um, but I don't I I mean there's reason to doubt that too. But that's the only case I can 
think yeah. of. Yeah, so the, we're talking, you know, 120 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> it yeah. may have possibly worked. But he did the same thing with semiconductors in China. And, and yeah. really all that does is if we're not going to ship chips, we're just going to say, hey, we're not going to ship chips to you. We're going to, you know, it's not a tariff, but, you know, we're going to have these controls. It's just going to force them to find an alternative for not needing your product. And it doesn't yeah. long term, it, it doesn't work. It just hurts. It's a it's a good sound bite for a politician, yeah. but that's it. Americans pay tariffs uh, as you pay taxes. It's just the same. China doesn't pay. Mexico doesn't pay. Americans pay. American importers pay. Businesses and consumers pay tariffs. So that's uh, Trump. I don't think he's ever understood that. And uh, you pay in two ways. One, the direct payment for the tariff, but then also the higher prices from the restricted uh, supply and higher costs associated with the domestic good than you could otherwise get, you know, outside the border. So, um, you know, you could drive it, drive us further into a Great Depression um, with that kind of policy. But nonetheless, overall, I mean, I don't think Trump uh, wants to get rid of oil and gas. So mm -hmm. there's that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, so, so we have a grid that actually can work and function and we're not relying on other countries. That's good for our energy. Yeah. Yeah, we, we might be able to keep our gas stoves and, you know, and we won't have, you know, rolling brownouts. So, you know, right. I, you, know you take what you can get. <laughs> you know, I love my gas stove so much. I might become a member of the deep state just so I can keep it when those things come down. I, I know, right? The, that's the thing. We, we're developing a ruling class that has all the privileges and access to everything, right. you know, including including charter flights and yeah. and, and and a life without vaccine, without uh, COVID, COVID boosters. You know, you can get all that stuff if you're part of the elites. But if you're part of the hoi polloi, uh, like you and I are, are mm -hmm. ninety nine percent of the public is, then um, yeah, you have to you have to comply and go along. Um, uh, you know, I, I do think it's important to understand something um, when you talk about the kind of economic policies and the economic situation under a new presidential administration. What could happen? We are not yet come to terms with what is happening already now. Almost all the economic data that are being cranked out by the agencies these days are fake. So the the job data are fake. Um, you know, on mul multiple levels, we've been losing uh, full time jobs for a year. All jobs in the last twelve months have been uh, new part time jobs. Uh, real income is still declining, um, and we'll 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 find that out for sure from the Census Bureau because they I think they're still telling the truth about about that. Unlike the Department of Labor. And the output data is has been heavily, heavily manipulated by fake GDP statistics that privilege government spending over actual productivity. So I, my own view, and we can talk about this some other time, but I don't think we ever got out of the recession of March 2020. We never left it. The reason we haven't had a hard landing uh, in the so-called recovery is that there never really was a recovery. We we're just going further into, into depression. And to bounce back to the unemployment data, they talk about unemployment rate at 3.6. But once you include discouraged workers and all the people who dropped out of the labor force after lockdowns, so we've it's, it's, never recovered in terms of um, labor participation. Uh, uh, or population uh, worker ratios, um, you can get figures that are as high as 23 and 24 percent. Uh, I believe on, it. On, on unemployment. And that compares to, I think, the height of unemployment at the Great Depression was 25.6. We're very close to Great Depression levels in terms of unemployment. Output. I think we're in a long secular re recession. And then inflation data, um, Lawrence Summers, the last decent president of, of, of Harvard and an economist, uh, just released a paper from the National Bureau of Economic Research recalculating inflation over the last uh, 20 years, uh, consistently applying uh, the cost of money, so you know, um, the borrowing costs of, of mortgages, and cars and credit card loans and and all that. That's just one piece of the CPI, which include excludes that, and came up with. And you're not going to believe this, uh, Doug. Came up with a peak inflation number of eighteen percent. And and this is not you know 
some cranky friend of mine who says, well, I don't believe these inflation numbers. I think it's worse than it looks. 18% from, from the most establishment-oriented economist in this country publishing a paper with the National Bureau of Economic Research, which is the official business cycle dating institution, private, not government, but official. And he says that inflation peaked at 18%. Now, the inflation of 1979 and 1980 uh, only reached to thirteen percent. So we're and that was revolutionary, right? That yep. brought in a new president that led yep. American households to go from one incomes to two. It was it was it was unprecedented cultural political upheaval as a result of that inflation. So you know you're talking about an inflation even worse than we experienced in 1979, 1980, um, and that doesn't even include all the machinations around health insurance costs, which they have the most cockamamie formula for determining how much health insurance uh, 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 is going up in terms of CPI. And they, they, we talked about that again some other time. But let's just say that last year, that, or in 2020, 20, sorry, 2022, the, the Bureau of Labor Statistics said your health insurance went down um, about uh, 40%. Okay, well, you know that's not true. Right, so how do they come up with that? It's another subject. I can explain it. Doesn't matter, but that's what's manipulating this data. So, in other words, the inflation data is is wildly fake. The output data is is fake, and the unemployment data is wildly fake. What does that tell you about our current times? What it tells me is that we're probably right now in something like the Great Depression that we saw in the 1930s. We just don't know it because the data is all lying to us. So whatever you want to say about the grim future, like we need to come to ter terms with the reality now. And the truth is that most people experience this now. You, you talk to anybody, you know, how are things going? Listen, it's terrible. You know, this is, this is I'm, I'm suffering. I'm barely able to get by. I'm, I'm living pay paycheck to paycheck. I can hardly go shopping anymore. This is what they'll tell you. But then you, you ask the Biden administration, no, oh, it's the greatest recovery in human history. So we live in this weird fantasy world yeah. of, of, of fake data, uh, almost like you know, uh, you know, Khrushchev's Russia, where the economy is always growing, but the people are always getting poor. <laughs> yes. That's sort of what yeah. we're in right now. You see these job numbers, and all, I 100% I buy into everything that you're that you're talking about because the, the numbers do not feel right to me. You know, you see people with three jobs and complaining they can't. Never mind buy a house; they can't pay rent and have a car payment. Uh, it just it, that 18% inflation rate probably feels right with all the. You know, you torture numbers enough, they'll tell you whatever they, <laughs> whatever you want them to say. You know, I don't, I'm not, I'm not blaming the Biden administration. I think this has probably been ongoing for a long, long, longer period of time than than just most recently. But yeah. boy, it, it's really, you can really feel it uh, right now. And you yeah. ask, like you said, you ask people around, it's it's tough out there for a lot of people. Um, so it is, and it frustrates me because you know we have these statistical releases that come out, you know, on regular intervals every two weeks, every month, whatever. And then, you know, the agencies pump out these fake numbers and then they end up in fake headlines and then Wall Street, you know, trades based on the headlines. Not that they believe them, but they believe that other people believe them. You know, it's the usual Wall Street dance. And so it means we're just kind of living in this weird fake world. And you look back, and this is why this Lawrence Summers paper from MBER rocked my world when I read it. I was like, oh, and, and keep in mind, he's only looking at one, one aspect of the CPI. And he calculates that we peaked at 18%. I was like, you know what? That makes a lot more sense. Jeffrey, uh, we're well over the time that I had allotted for you. And I really appreciate you being here. Uh, you have opened my eyes to a couple different scenarios uh, for this year that I hadn't considered. Where can people find you online if they're so inclined to, to look you up? Yeah, well, um, um, I you can't believe it, but I write every single day for the Epoch Times. I believe and, it. Yeah, <laughs> and you do believe it. And um, that is a nice little venue because it's it's actually uh, the fourth largest circulation newspaper in the United States. Mm -hmm. So I'm pleased to say um, that they're 
thriving, and I'm pleased to say that they somehow let me write for them six or seven days a week. So that's nice. And in addition to that, I run Brownstone Institute, and I and I try to write as little as possible uh, for Brownstone Institute because I, I, you know, it's not about me. But I still end up with two or three articles a week. So <laughs> you can always find my yeah. my stuff my stuff at Brownstone. Well, uh, thank you very much. And and you wrote the book Life After Lockdown. Yeah. Uh, I assume that that is online on Amazon and other outlets yeah. as well. Yeah. 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 So you, can get it, you can get it at Amazon. I was very pleased that Rand Paul uh, wrote a forward to the book. So. Yeah. Well, as always, Jeffrey, it was great catching up with you. Thank you for your time again. And we'll hope to have you on the channel once again soon. Good to see you, Doug. Thank you. All right. Thank you.